Stephen Bettis, thank you for uh, having this conversation with us. Why did it take as long as it did to get players in this summer? And would you concede that Sheffield United were ill-prepared for the start of the Premier League season? Uh, no, I wouldn't <laughs> concede that. I don't think you'd expect me to, to be honest. I think if people understand the complexities of the transfer window and the fact that you know, there's three parties involved, or four parties even. There's us, the other club, the player, and the agent, and all of those have to become aligned before deals can happen. You know, in an ideal world, we want everything done the first first day the window opens and just get all our business finished and, and move on. But I think if you look at this summer and the window that we had, it was a it was a challenging window, uh, probably the most challenging window I've had whilst I've worked at the at the football club. Um, obviously. Not only was we bringing in players, but we, we had the departure of Willemann and Sander as well in that window to, to, to address and handle. But I don't think uh, I don't, we were prepared for it um, if the worst happened. But these things just take time. And, you know, you have to get all the, all the, all the ducks in a row for the deals to get across the line. And that's, that's unfortunately the issue at times. Why was it such a challenging transfer window then? Because I don't think any other Premier League team started the season with a lineup like Sheffield United's when you face Crystal Palace? Yeah, I think, I think you could say that. I, I, I disagree. I think because you have to add into that our injuries as well. You know, we've got a couple of key injuries to players that actually um, wasn't, wasn't ready neither at that point. And if they would have been ready, I think we would have been in a better position. So from a squad perspective, we had the players there. Um, I think, yeah, uh, there, was, there was a few players near the end and a few things that happened near the end, which in an ideal world you would have done much sooner. But we, we couldn't get them done much sooner. And we was waiting for certain players to become available um, to, to make that happen. An example is using James McAtee. You know, he was probably our manager's number one target through the whole window. I think probably our supporter's number one target as well. But we were in constant communication with James and his agent and also Man City. And, you know, we at times we wasn't sure whether it was going to happen. We wasn't sure if they was going to let him out. You know, the manager at times didn't want to let him out and then he did. Um, and we just had to wait and be patient. And the reality is if, if, if we lose out on one or two games because of that, our manager was willing to take that risk to have him for the rest of the season. So that, that's, just, that's just how it happens sometimes. And no one likes it, but that's just what you have to deal with. Was there absolutely no way for business to have happened sooner though? Because one of the accusations that has, has kind of been made is that essentially these first few games of the Premier League have acted almost like the pre-season game should have started to acclimatise new signings, to get them used to how Sheffield United and Paul Heckingbottom want to play. And we're talking about the Premier League here. You know, this is the, the best league in the world. You have to be ready to go, especially as a promoted team, right from the off. And you've had some important games, you know, yeah. against the likes of Crystal Palace, Nottingham Forest, Everton, that, you know, for being really honest, they're games that you would think there's a chance there to get some vital points. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah, but I think... All I can say is that we did everything as quickly as we could. You know, like the, no, what, no one was sitting at home just relaxing, thinking, I oh, would we'll do that in a week's time. We was pushing as hard as we could to get every deal across the line as quickly as possible. The reality is they took the time they did because of all the complexities involved in it. But uh, I don't think it was on anyone's part, you know, them not doing their job at the football club. Everyone was working tirelessly to get it done as quickly as possible. With the departures of Njai and Berger, did the club anticipate the sort of time scale correctly on when they would potentially depart because I think there was always a belief that it was very possible that both players could leave but then they left so close to the start of the season and then it would have been preferable I suppose in that situation that the club would have acted correspondingly to, to make some transfers to yeah. fill their shoes and yet it did take a bit of time for those new players to come in so can you talk a bit about what exactly happened around those two departures? Yeah I mean we can, do, we can do them both, you know, like the reality of it is, is that we never wanted, to, both, both, both players, we wanted to stay at the football club, 100%. I wanted them, the manager wanted them, our owner wanted them to stay. So everybody was aligned in that respect. We did everything we could to keep the players here as well. Um, using Illiman as an example, firstly. Um, Everyone knew about the interest from Marseille. I think they'd expressed their interest quite a, quite a long time ago. And we know Illiman's uh, love and affiliation to the club, which we all understand and respect. So it was always going to be a difficult one. But we had lengthy conversations with Illiman and got to the point where actually a new deal was agreed with Illiman to, for him to stay. Um, a new, a new three-year deal was agreed. Terms were all agreed with him and his agent, and it was ready to go. 
the day of the signing, um, Illiman had second thoughts and asked for some more time to actually uh, to consider it. And then 24 hours, uh, 24 hours later said, nope, he, uh, he, he wanted to go and uh, go and play for Marseille and ach achieve his dream of, be of being there. So we'd worked tirelessly to actually keep him here and did everything we could. And it wasn't a money thing at the end. You know, we'd done, every we'd done what we needed to do from a money perspective and a contract perspective to keep him here. But he just decided that the pool of playing for Marseille and the Champions League at that point was too big for him to turn down. So although we had a plan for him possibly not being here, uh, there was a point where we'd got all the right vibes that he was staying and we thought there, it was not an issue. Using, taking Sander into account, Sander was exactly the same. Um, we got an offer from Burnley about five weeks before we sold Sander. Um, we turned it down immediately and we said to Burnley that it didn't meet our valuation of the player. We told them what our valuation of the player was then and they said, there's no way we're going to pay that for the player. So we said, okay, fine, then he's staying here. And then we started speaking, I was speaking to Sander, I was speaking to his agent, and Paul was speaking to Sander as well. And we were discussing what was the next steps in terms of does he stay, you know, what do we do about his contract, etc. Because also we have to be mindful that we're not a club that can let a player value that Illiman's value or Sander's player just leave on a free transfer. That's not that's not good business for us and we don't have that luxury. So we need to, we need to manage it carefully. Um, and we spoke to Sandra about doing an, a one year extension on his contract because he didn't want to do a, a long term contract with us. Um, and, and, and those discussions were happening. And then four or five weeks later, Burnley came to us and, gave, and made a new offer, which again, we refused and said, we told you our valuation of the player, unless you meet that, he's not going. And we then got three or four offers uh, further from them until the point that actually they paid the valuation of the player so we 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 accepted it you know like we didn't have to but we accepted it because we felt it was the right thing for the club at that point and when Sander then also expressed that he wasn't he didn't he didn't wish to sign an extension to his contract at that point we needed to make a decision are we going to make it not make him stay but ask him to stay and leave on a free next summer or are we going to sell him take the money at what we think is the correct valuation for the player that, at that point and then go to the market and look for someone else. And I think, you know, as you, as you know, we then went out and, and, and brought Hamer in, who I think uh, um, for us is a really good signing on a long-term contract and he's young and he's an asset for this football club in the future. And that's, and that's my job is to make sure that we're keeping this club on the right path with, with you know, and, and using the money correctly. And I feel that, you know, that's what, that's what happened with those. You know, you can, you can talk about what we did, but let's get it straight. Three, three days after that or whatever, the night before the first games of the season, Tottenham sold Harry Kane. You know, like, it's football. We don't control it. We don't control when the offers come in. We don't control, what, what, you know, the players' reactions to those. We're all human beings. And at that point, we just have to address it and, and, and move, with, move with, with it and transition to the next, to the next step. And I think all, all clubs are experiencing it to different levels. And perhaps Zam was just more than normal. But I think that's because we've actually got good players here that actually other clubs you know, want, want to take and want to pay big money for. So the reality of it is, is that we're going to have those problems and we should want those problems in more windows because that means we've got players here that other teams and you know, teams that are in the Champions League and teams that are at the top of the Premier League want to take from us because if they are doing that, that means we're doing our job well. Just to go back to Illiman and Jai, new three-year deal agreed. It, it seems as if he's going to stay at the football club. It sounds a little bit like you had him in the net and he's squirmed back out and swam back off into the ocean there. How did you not get that one over the line? Because we was drafting the contracts the night, that, that night. The next morning he literally woke up and had a change of heart, you know, like, and it was nothing, there was nothing that happened. There was no communication between, you know, 11 o'clock that evening and 10 a.m. the next morning, apart from, he, he, you know, he slept on it and, he, and you know, human Could you beings. not have done anything? That? I mean, he's, people are talking about him as being the best player that Sheffield United have had in decades. Yeah. When he wakes up and says, actually on second thoughts, was there not one last trick up your sleeve or something to, to say, look, you know, we'll, we'll just sweeten that pot ever so slightly to keep such a vital player? We asked the question. Of course we did, you know, like, because our intention was to keep him, but he made it clear that wasn't, that wasn't what it was about. As I said, his decision at the end wasn't driven by money. It was driven by his desire to go and play um, for his child, you know, childhood, childhood dream club. So. Do you have a lot of regrets for that, though, given that you were so close to keeping him? And as I mentioned, he is a player that 
if we're being really honest, could be the difference maybe down the line between staying in the Premier League and not staying in the Premier League? I think maybe supporters won't like my answer to this, but I don't have regret because actually we, we got a player from Borenwood on a free, you know, like that we brought through the ranks, we gave opportunity, he took the opportunity and we sold him for a large sum of money, you know, like, and, and ultimately we have to accept that we're not at the top of the tree in terms of us at the moment as a football club. And there are clubs that are a lot more bigger than us and a lot more attractive to us than players. And we have to accept that we are going to lose clubs to bigger teams. You know, like Marseille are a bigger team. They're playing in the Champions League, etc. Forget the fact that Ilman had the affiliation to them at all. We have to accept that these challenges are going to come. But actually, when you, when you look at it on paper in, in the cold light of day, actually it's what, you know, it's... It, it's we should be proud of what we achieved there, you know, not, not, you know, not ashamed of it, you know. Why hasn't the club done a better job over the years making sure that a talented young player like Illiman and Jai is not signed to a contract sooner? So you don't face this pinch point of we either need to get him signed now or we have to sell him because we run the risk of losing him for nothing in 12 months. Because it... You need, you need all parties to agree to it. The reality of it is, uh, don't, don't think that we sit here, when players get to one year left on their contract, don't think that that's when we finally decide to, you know, dust off, dust off the uh, checkbook and have a look at their contracts. I mean, we're looking at everyone's contracts every season and reviewing them and saying, do they need looking at, you know? Illiman was offered a contract the year before. Illiman was offered a contract during the season, you know, all of which he turned down. You know, there was a, there, there was a desire, I think, from the player and the manager and, and the agent to have control over the next step for Illiman. And they, they did feel like, and I understand that, they, they felt like there was, there was a next step for Illiman, which was away from this football club, because they felt he had the ability, and I think we all do think he has the ability to go on to be bigger and better, you know, and he felt he needed a different stage to do that. So they was very very clever about the way they managed they managed it and ultimately we were making the offers um but they wasn't willing to sign so um as i said it can't the the blame can't always just be put at the clubs the clubs uh, you know door and and also we just can't be writing checks for whatever sum any player wants to stay because otherwise this club won't be here because it would be broke you know like ultimately we have budgets and we have to be sustainable in the way we work so we have if if the parameters of the deal don't work for us we can't do it and we just have to be accepting of that then ultimately the next step is okay let's maximize the biggest return we can from him before his contract expires and and utilize that money well in the transfer window and go again and i think that's what we've tried to do Sheffield united fans will be well aware that there are players next summer who will be out of contract, senior players, upcoming youngsters who are very exciting. Um, is the same situation inevitable? You know, will other players leave this football club potentially on free transfers or need to be sold in the next transfer window to avoid losing them for free? Is based on what you're saying, is that something that just this football club and others that's just the reality of the yeah, situation. Yeah, that's football. That's the reality of football. You know, like, I don't think we're the only, we're not the only club in that position. You know, like, I mean, I've mentioned Harry Kane already as a prime example. You know, one of the, one of the best players, English players that we've got at the present. And, and Spurs lost him, you know, like for pretty much the same reasons we lost Illiman, you know. And that's the reality of the situation. That's the reality of football. And we're faced with those challenges every day. And we have to manage them to the best of our ability. And yeah, we will, we will lose players, um, that because they're out of contract, and we and we will lose players again where we sell them because they've got one year left on their contract. Of course we did, will, but we also will extend some as well. You know, like so, um, it's business, and that's the that's the reality of the situation. How are the talks currently going with the players that are out of contract next summer? Is anything particularly close? Are there any that you're concerned about? No, I, I don't think there's concerns. You know, like I, I mean, it, it's the day-to-day -day life of being involved in football. You know, we, we are reviewing all of those players at the moment. We have reviewed them extensively before and discussions have been already had with some of those players and discussions will continue to be had with, some, with those players. With the players that you've, you've brought in towards the end of the window, would overall you consider this transfer window a success for Sheffield United? Yeah, personally, I would. Yeah, I would consider it a success. As you say, we, we, we'd love to have got, it, got our business done quicker and sooner. Um, I think everyone's agreed on that. But ultimately, I, I, I don't put 
the blame for that at all because the reality is, is that's just the way it works at times. Um, but I think when you look back at it, we, you know, we, we, we've done some good business. We've brought in some really talented young players on long-term contracts um, that, you know, that have value for the football club in the future. And I think we're, we're set up in a way that ultimately we can push on next season if we're, if we're, hopefully if we're in the Premier League. And if not, we're in a really good position if we're in the Championship to hopefully bounce back up again. Is the owner of Sheffield United still seeking to sell this football club? Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any secret about that. I think he's publicly come out and, and said that. But I think he's, he's mindful of, um, look, no one really owns a football club. They're just taking care of it for a period of time, in my opinion. And I think he's mindful of that. And he wants to make sure that the right person comes in to take it over that's going to take it to the next level and give it the injection of uh, investment to take it, you know, to, to make it a a club that sits in the Premier League looking upwards rather than downwards, etc. Um, and until that happens and until the right person's found, he'll still be here, you know? And, and I think if you look at actually where the club's come in the last four, five, six, seven years, um, you know, it, 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 it's moving forward, you know? It, it, the, the facilities are better. They own their facilities, as a prime example. The club owns its stadium, the club owns its training facilities, the club owns all this. It never did before, you know? So it's in a really good position in that respect. And also, you know, we've got a squad with value in and we've spent three seasons, this is our third season now in the Premier League, you know, like, and it's kind of like, it's, it's in a good place and, it, and, and you know, and until the right person comes to take it over, I, I think, you know, Prince Abdul has done a great job of bringing it to where it is today. Yeah, on that topic, I mean, this is Yorkshire's only Premier League football club. It's right in the heart of the city. It's got a rich history. It's got a great fan base. Why then is this football club being connected to people like Henry Maurice and Dozy Mabusi, you know, who appear in the eyes of quite a lot of people to be totally inappropriate suitors to buy this football club. Why can't this club find someone as attractive as it is to take this forward now with proper funds and a proper plan? Yeah, I, I ask the same question at times, to be honest, because I, I think that I think it's a great football club. It's got a great fan base, great supporters. It's, you know, it's it's got great infrastructure you know, and you know with some investment you can really drive this football club forward and for me it's 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 a great opportunity for someone to buy a football club and 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 you know sort of move it move it on so I, I asked myself the same question but you know there are people that are being spoken to and I think that you know when you really look at the really good people and the serious people that start looking at the football club you don't hear about them until they want you to hear about them you know hopefully that does happen and if it doesn't you know we're still in a really good position at the moment and we've got an owner that loves and respects this football club and 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 takes care of it in my opinion and and drives it still forward to the best of his ability with the funds that we have available is the proper due diligence being done though i mean that's i suppose that would be a concern amongst fans these are the two individuals who've been connected to this football club when this is eventually sold unless it's jeff bezos or somebody like that who everybody knows how are you going to know that this is the right person for the club with the right aims, the right money, the, the actual, uh, they are appropriate to be the custodian of Sheffield United Football Club? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I think they didn't buy the football club either of those two parties because at the end of the day, they didn't, they didn't get there for, for, for reasons that, you know, that are confidential and I won't go into. But I, I think, you know, we're, we're improving our diligence that we're doing on prospective owners and we're learning from it as well um, to make sure that we're trying to find the right person going forward. And I think that's something that, that, that's something that hopefully will happen in the future. Yeah. So, but do you, do you feel like that is something that you almost have to reassure fans with as we enter this process now, which by the sound of things is moving along quickly? No, it's not moving quickly. There are there are a few interested parties still at the moment, you know, like and and obviously due diligence is has been done and continues to be done on them and and discussions are ongoing and around, you know, their intentions for the club and whether it's, you know, how they're gonna move it forward and what their aspirations are, etc., to make sure that we're happy with with, with what they're doing. Um, and until I think all of those 
things are satisfied and both parties are happy to do the deal, nothing changes. How often do you speak to the owner and maybe offer him advice on this situation? Are the negotiations between yourself and Prince Abdullah quite frequent when you talk about takeovers? And how involved are you in the process? No, I don't, if I'm honest, I don't talk about him, uh, I don't talk to him a huge amount about the takeover. I talk to him regularly, especially in the transfer window. I talk to him hourly in the transfer window. But um, it, on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't, I don't talk to him, you know, I talk to him once or twice a week. Um, but um, in terms of the takeover, he's, he's obviously got a holding company in, in United World, which I think, uh, you know, everyone's aware of. And they, they drive it forward initially. Um, and they speak to the interested parties and we keep it at arm's length and at the point where they really want to deep dive into the information and get a feel for the football club then and, and at the point when also um, they're happy and they feel comfortable that these are potential you know people to buy to take over the football club then they come and meet me and spend time with me and I give them all the information and show them the facilities etc. If the club hadn't have been promoted how much financial trouble would it have been in, in the championship? In a weird way, it, it wouldn't have been hugely... It, I mean, don't get me wrong, promotion is, is great for the football club and the, and the, the, the money that comes with it, it, it helps, us, helps us out a lot. But there was, there was a plan for how we actually... You know, it, it's, there's, there's no lie that it was really tough from a financial perspective last season because we stretched every penny to try to make sure that we had the best opportunity to get promoted. Unfortunately, it went well, but it would have been difficult, no doubt about it. But, you know, with the likes of selling one or two players, that would have resolved the situation and, and everything would have been fine. And what lessons have been learned to avoid a situation happening again where the team is relegated? You know, it's, it's football, it can happen, it could happen again. And then it finds itself in a transfer embargo very, you know, 18 months after that relegation. What, what's, what lessons have been learned to avoid that happening again? Look, I think I'm a boring accountant, so I actually, you know, that's all I do is numbers and, and, and looking at the numbers, etc. I have budgets for finishing every position in the league and getting relegated and what happens in one year, two year, three years if we're in Championship, Premier League. I've got every single connotation. Ultimately, um, when you look at the last, with the last season, we had opportunities to sell players which um, our owner chose not to. Um, understanding the pressures that that would put on the club financially, but he made that decision because he wanted to, uh, he wanted to try to succeed and, and get promoted and felt we could get promoted. And, and fortunately, fortunately it did happen. But he, he knew the risks associated with, with what we was doing um, and they were calculated risks. And uh, we, we, had, we had ways of getting out of them at the end of the season if we got to the point and we didn't get, rele uh, didn't get promoted. Why do you think the club has so many injuries? That's a tough one. Yeah, I, I mean, it's something that we're continually discussion, discussing at the moment. And it's a real frustration for everybody. <laughs> I think just saying bad luck ain't, is not a good enough, uh, good enough answer anymore. Um, there has been an element of bad luck to some of the injuries, you know, like Max Lowe treading on a sprinkler in, against the hobby in, a, in one of our pre-season games, etc. That, that's bad luck, but there's a lot of soft tissue injuries that we're looking at and going, why are these happening? Um, you know, when we, when we looked at it, we've had this the last few seasons, if you actually look at it, and when we looked at it, when we looked at it last season, you know, there was, there was periods where, you know, our promotion challenge could have been affected by injuries as well and we're all aware of it um, and at the time a lot of it was attributing to the pitches etc at the training ground and, and the fact that, the, that during the during the winter months they were difficult but um, that's gone away now because obviously we've got we've probably got one of the best playing surfaces in the Premier League you know like because basically we've got a brand new Deso pitch there which you know no one can really have any better than that as a surface to play on so you can't use that as an excuse anymore. So, so now, now we've got to look at the other areas and, and, and see, see what we're doing wrong or if, if we are doing anything wrong. And that, that is something that's now on the agenda for us to look at since the transfer window's closed. Well, where's the club at in terms of you know, major change to the training ground? Because that has often been talked about as important. Yep. Uh, I mean, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but we, we, you know, we're still... You know, we're, We've had a couple of sites we've been in discussions with, uh, with the local authority. It's difficult to find somewhere, firstly, um, in, in the areas that we're looking that actually would be suitable for a new training, training ground. Um, and we haven't got enough space where we are. Uh, you know, we've all talked, we've talked about it before. We want, we want a Cat One Academy, and then we want 
training facilities for, the, for our women's team and we want training facilities for the first team. Um, where we are at Shycliffe at the moment, we could turn that literally into training facilities for the women and for Cat 1 and move the first team elsewhere and that seems to be the logical solution. Um, but it's finding the site and we've had numerous sites that we've been talking to the local authority about and we've got quite far down the line and they've not happened. We're still in discussions and we've got a site again that we are really far down the line with in terms of agreeing something with them. We've actually agreed a price with them to buy it, to buy the land from the local authority, but there's still some further hurdles that we need to get over first. Um, if we can get those done, the plan is to move the first team to the new facility and uh, and and keep keep the academy and turn it to Cat 1 at Shycliffe. So it's still ongoing and it's taking longer than we want and it's frustrating, but everyone's still putting their best efforts into trying to make it happen. When you investigate as a football club to try and get to the bottom of the injuries, how do you go about sort of assessing like, okay, how much is training facilities to blame? How much is, uh, I suppose, the day-to-day methods of a, of, a, of a footballer or a coaching staff to set things up? What are training methods? Do they play a part in this? Do you have to sort of, do you even have to go and talk to the manager and ask him about those things? That could be quite an uncomfortable conversation, but you have to actually go and have those conversations to try and find out exactly what the issue is here. Yeah, yeah, we've had those conversations and they're not difficult conversations. You know, Paul's completely open to them. You know, he doesn't want the injuries as much as we don't want the injuries. So, you know, and, and we've had open conversations with all of the training staff at the, at the club and basically you know it's not this is not about pointing fingers and it's not about trying to find someone to blame for it it's trying to highlight where the issue is learn from it and be better you know so it's not like it's not a witch hunt for us going out to find out who's causing the problems it's basically working together to find the problem and find a solution to it. So we're looking at all of the areas you talked about. We're looking at all of them. We're looking at the facilities. We're looking at the training regime. We're looking at the nutrition. We're looking at every element, the sports science side of it, to try and ascertain if we're doing something wrong, where what it is, and fix it. What kind of a job do you think Paul Heckingbottom has done when he took over the football club? It was in a difficult position in the championship. Now... You've just played Manchester City, the European champions, uh, Bramall Lane. How good a job has he done in this time since since take, retaking over as manager? Yeah, I mean, I don't think you'll be surprised for me to say that he's done a great job. You know, like you know, everyone's really you know really happy with what Paul's done. He's been, he's been excellent. But you know, the important part for us as well is. You know, we we talked about it when we reappointed Paul. I talked about it when we reappointed Paul, and the way he. You know he's smart. He's not. Just, you know he, he thinks about the big picture. He understands. He understands. You know, the, the the needs and wants of a football club, not just the needs and wants of of a manager. And and he doesn't just look at short term. He looks at long term. And he knows that even looking at long term may detriment the short term, and maybe even detriment himself. You know, because all managers are judged on the short term and and the next one, two, three games. You know, because that's the reality of the situation. But he doesn't let affect let that affect his decision making process about is it the right thing for the football club, and that for me is the really the key important thing with Paul, which which I really admire about him is that we can sit and we can talk about 